welcome to the Asset Talk. We are delighted to have with us today Piyush Gupta, CEO of Singapore's DBS. Having joined the bank in 2009, Piyush is the longest serving CEO of the bank, certainly since the 1990s when the assets started to track the bank's transformation. Transform is what he has done and continues to do today. The bank's total assets and net income have nearly tripled since he started, having grown steadily by 146% and 161% respectively since 2010. Return on equity in 2021 is the second highest in more than a decade at 12.5% from the 1.8% in 2010. Piyush has pivoted the bank to become digital, in fact, embracing the digital economy since 2013-2014. And today, the bank is reaping the benefits. Piyush, welcome to the Asset Talk. Well, I'm very happy to uh, join you, uh, Daniel. Look forward to the conversation. Fantastic. Uh, Piyush, in a year such as uh, 2021, when the business environment has been quite challenging, DBS has returned some interesting, strong financial outcomes. Were you quite surprised by that outcome? Uh, well, I mean, in the first instance, I we anticipated that um, you would see some rebound from the collapse of 2020. And so we did expect some tailwinds coming from the fact the economy just can't continue that low for that long. You would expect to see some rebound. But I have to say the breadth and scale of economic activity did actually take me by surprise, positively. Our balance sheet grew like 9% or so. Uh, you know, in a typical pre-pandemic year, we were growing 5 6%. And I thought we'd probably get back to 6 7%. So the extra couple of percentage points was a surprise. But uh, what was the biggest surprise? It was very broad-based. It was across sectors. It was across geographies. Um, our liabilities continued to grow, which I think we anticipated because of the easy monetary policy. Uh, but the you know non-interest income categories, wealth management, credit cards, investment banking, everything came through a double-digit growth, which was again a little bit of a surprise. I think uh, I have to say the one thing which I have been surprised by consistently now for the last couple of years um, and more has been the resiliency of the portfolio. Mm. You know, I anticipated that cost of credit could be much higher. Uh, in the wake of sectoral dislocation and, you know, aviation and tourism and lack of travel, but also other kinds of challenges around uh, F&B and retail and consumption spending. Uh, in part, obviously, central bank policy actions and fiscal response has put a little bit of a cushion uh, for most people. But that notwithstanding, as the moratorium got over and central bank policy started winding down, I thought you'd see a much sharper pickup in cost of credit. And that mm. hasn't come through uh, either. So I have to admit that uh, if I had to choose one area I was uh, surprised by positively uh, was that the uh, you know NPS and cost of credit were actually fairly well contained. Uh, you mentioned cost of credit, uh, Piyush. Uh, is there an expectation that uh, it it could uh, turn the other way uh, given what's going on in the world today? Well, I would uh, uh, say that the answer to that is yes. And there are two or three uh, specific drivers that you have to keep a close eye on. Uh, the first, just going back to the resiliency of the portfolio. Uh, typically, in slow economic environments, the portfolios that you need to watch are the SME portfolios, small and medium enterprises, and um, the unsecured consumer book. Now, these, like I said, were more resilient than we expected. And I think apart from government support, they were also benefited from the effectively zero interest rate environment. So cost of debt service is particularly low. Uh, as interest rates start going up, and that's been well flagged at this stage, uh, you would expect that cost of debt servicing to start proving to be a little bit more challenging for both mm -hmm. of these sectors. So you should expect to see some um, you know, give back uh, from that uh, standpoint. Uh, the second thing that's happening, which you've got to watch, is inflationary pressures. Uh, it's quite clear that apart from the idiosyncratic increase in gas and oil and the energy complex, uh, you're seeing the impact of the war flow through in all kinds of other primary goods, uh, softs, food, metals, etc. So as your input costs are going up, uh, second, wage inflation is coming through, and wage inflation is typically very sticky. 
So I worry that again, uh, sectors like the SMEs will find it very hard to pass on that inflationary impulse into their own pricing, in which case their margins will start getting a squeeze. So that's the second driver you need to walk, watch, which is the impact of the inflation impulse, and particularly, like I said, the energy complex and the food complex. Uh, so that's the second uh, uncertainty uh, as you go forward. And the third, of course, uh, you know, I think you will see a lot more idiosyncratic risk, both from geopolitics as well as from um, unusual situations. Uh, you know, the FT, for example, last week uh, was, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, all over about this nickel trading company. Uh, it's actually not nickel trading company, it's a nickel producer. And uh, so somebody like the nickel producer is doing the right thing, hedging their production. But when you see such extreme volatility in commodity prices, it tends to create challenges in liquidity and margin calls, etc. And you could see more idiosyncratic situations of that sort. Uh, so I would uh, put all of that together and say this year is going to be a fairly choppy year. You've got to keep your eye very closely on the uh, portfolio. Yusha, you're right. We're heading into quite a bit of volatility and remaining agile will be quite important. Now, in terms of DBS, uh, we've seen that during COVID in the last two years, there's been a lot of uh, activity in terms of M&A, uh, most recently with your purchase of uh, Cities Consumer Banking business in Taiwan. Uh, I'm curious about this, particularly uh, in terms of whether you looked at other uh, units of city which are selling uh, consumer banking and perhaps uh, why did you did not proceed with the others. Thank you. Well, Daniel, yes. Uh, the short answer is we did. Uh, we looked at the city um, you know, units in the, in the locations where we already have a banking license and a franchise uh, because, as you know, the sale did not come with the license. And therefore, there's some countries like, you know, Thailand or Malaysia, which were ruled out for us. Uh, we don't have licenses over there. Uh, but uh, we looked at uh, India, Indonesia, China and Taiwan, the four countries that matter to us and uh, where we already have a banking presence and uh, license. Uh, now, of those for various reasons, uh, in some cases, scale, in some cases, value, uh, in some cases, just bandwidth, uh, we chose not to proceed in three out of the four. Uh, but Taiwan is something that made a lot of sense to us. As you know, I, I used to run the city business in the region 10, 12 years ago. And I've always fancied the Taiwan business as one of the crown jewels of the city Asian uh, empire, both their wealth the franchise as well as their credit card franchise. And, uh, you know, when you uh, looked at uh, the range of business, um, the opportunity and the possibilities, and what it does for us in Taiwan, it gives us scale, it makes us the dominant player among the foreign banks. Uh, it just seemed um, sensible to focus our energies on trying to do that one trade. Hmm. Is, I, I wonder, uh, Piyush, is there a benefits from the consumer banking side to say in Taiwan uh, that can help with say corporate banking? Well, uh, Daniel, as you know, the big challenge for you know foreign banks, international banks in any market, uh, to grow the corporate banking business is typically funding. You know, we don't have a large funding base. So when you go there, you're typically not competitive in pricing in local currency uh, because you're typically pricing off the wholesale markets or fixed deposits, and that doesn't give you the ability to compete with the local banks. And so willy-nilly, you wind up being a niche player. You wind up being either a foreign currency uh, credit provider or do some kind of a niche activities in investment banking and so on. Uh, where you can actually get yourself a credible funding base from the retail uh, and wealth franchises that's therefore extraordinarily helpful in trying to diversify your corporate banking business. That is one of the big attractions of the City Trans Taiwan franchise for us. It comes with $15 billion in liabilities and that without a doubt will make a difference to our ability to position our corporate franchise as well. Indeed, indeed. And of course, City uh... Taiwan itself, the purchase follows your deals uh, to acquire a, a stake in Shenzhen Rural Commercial Bank in April of 2021 and also to infuse capital into Lakshmi Vilas Bank in November 2020. Very active uh, couple of years. Uh, what's behind all, all of these acquisitions? Well, you know, Daniel, uh, again, I've said before, you know, if you think long term, you know, 20, 30 years out, uh, then it's quite clear that. Uh, our current DBS footprint, which is uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and you know, small presence in the other markets, uh, will need to be uh, 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 supported by deeper presence 
in at least one or two big countries outside of the city states. And uh, we've been quite focused. We don't want to try too many, but we've said between China, India, Indonesia, Taiwan, these four markets, we need to try and get scale in at least a couple of these markets to ensure DBS's long-term success. Uh, so there's been a large part of our agenda in the last years. We've tried it uh, different ways. We tried to skin the cat. Um, you know, we tried four or five years through a programmatic uh, approach. Uh, didn't work very well. Uh, we then tried another four or five years through a pure digital approach. And that we found has limitations as well. And so we finally came to the conclusion that what you need is a, what I call a digital approach, the best of both worlds. You need to have digital differentiation. But if you can also have some brand presence, some uh, presence on the ground, some uh, old fashioned distribution capability, uh, that's probably the best way to string these two together. Uh, one of the problems with that approach, of course, has been that banking is a very protected industry. And for the better part of the last decade, it was uh, impossible for banks to go and make large scale acquisitions overseas. The regulators won't permit you. Um, that's changed in the last couple of years. The pandemic helped to accelerate some of that. And so lo and behold, we suddenly found the opportunity uh, because we subsidized in India. We found the opportunity to play white knight to uh, the Lakshmi Vilas franchise. Uh, we found the opportunity to take a meaningful uh, stake in Chennai Dual Commercial Bank, where we are now the largest shareholder. And then the city assets came along. So it is consistent with our thinking that if we can create a digital presence, it will allow us to start scaling up a couple of these countries outside our city state presence and do it in a way that we think will give us some good uh, outcomes and results. Indeed. And as you mentioned, digital is quite important uh, for DBS. Uh, I, I take note. I think uh, back in 2013 was when the first year I heard you talk a, quite a bit about uh, digital uh, transformation for the bank, uh, and DBS is clearly on that pathway. Uh, today, we're seeing a lot of uh, discussions, a flurry of digital activity from cryptocurrencies, digital assets, NFTs, DeFi, DAO, and the metaverse, Web 3.0, underpinned by blockchain and AI. Uh, where will DBS be in a few years, and how do you see it changing, perhaps, the future of banking? Uh, that's, it's, a, it's a big question, Daniel, and, and the short answer is I, I'm not honestly sure that I know um, everything. I do can I can see the direction of travel. Let me just um, reflect on one thought. See, when we started digitizing, and people use the word very loosely, but to me, the digital transformation was really about reimagining the customer journeys, uh, trying to make everything paperless, get instant fulfillment, uh, and uh, get into the throes of what is increasingly called embedded finance, use ecosystems data to be where the customers tend to be. Uh, we started that, as you correctly said, in 2013-14. So we've been doing it for seven, eight years. And we've got uh, meaningful uh, value and outcomes from all the steps we took over this long seven, eight year period. Uh, but one thing is quite clear at the end of this two years of pandemic, that level of digitization is now table stakes. You know, everybody's doing it. And everybody has accelerated that level of digitization uh, over this 24-month uh, period. And therefore, if you want to compete in the future, that is still critical. It's uh, a, a necessary condition, but it might not be a sufficient condition. You still have to focus on continuing to improve the customer journey. All of those things still stand. But the three uh, trends, mega trends, which I think might um, actually define the next level of the journey, uh, which is what I call the step beyond digitization, after digitiz digitization what? Uh, the first of these is what you refer to, I think data and AI. It's been an important part of the first uh, digitization stage, but where the world is today, I think data and AI, uh, machine learning, is going to play an even more crucial role. Uh, I'm seeing that already in the last year or two, when customer contact and connectivity was more challenged, we relied more and more on data. Today we have hundreds of uh, machine learning models running in every part of the bank. And we're beginning to see the value of those come through, whether on improved revenues or improved costs or even improved credit. So I think that will continue to be a big driver of the future. The second big thrust uh, I think will change everything is uh, blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is going to, is reach tipping point. It's reach tipping point because the technology itself or distributed ledger technology which calls into question the previous arrangements of hub and spoke and allows people to transact from person to person or company to company. I think that is fundamentally very powerful. I'm going to come back to that idea. 
Uh, the third thing which I think is likely to make a big change is uh, AR, VR. I mean, with, when, you, when, you, when you lay 5G and the bandwidth availability, with some of the new developments on being able to create artificial and virtual world, uh, you can see the impact of that in the gaming world already. But I think you will see more of that in what people are loosely calling metaverse. So the form factor of being able to operate in not a 2D but a 3D world, I think that could have some fairly important consequences for uh, the way the world is going. So we take these three. Uh, I've already talked about AI and machine learning. We're already doing a lot of that. Uh, it's not an easy journey, by the way. We've been at the journey now for four or five years. The big challenge with that part of the journey is data. You've got to get your hands and get the data stuff right, which means the data architecture, the data cleanups, the data governance models, the metadata to describe the data, the responsible use of data practices. It's not an easy journey to go through. Uh, we've done four or five years of that, and I'm fairly confident that that will put some more daylight between us and many other players because we've taken uh, you know, significant steps in that journey. Blockchain, which yeah. is the second, I believe blockchain is going to uh, has the power to change the back office of the world without a doubt. So I think about you know three, four layers of the blockchain, Daniel. The back office, which is how do settlement systems work today? How do clearing systems work today? How does the trade finance architecture work today? I think all of that is going to change. And it's going to change irrespective of what you feel about cryptocurrency and digital coins and tokens, because this is a far more efficient way of actually making transaction flow work. And uh, you're beginning to see this happen uh, in many private world blockchain solutions. You're also beginning to see this hit tipping point in many other larger scale solutions. So I think that's going to be tab the table stakes of the future. Rethinking the back office of the world, leveraging that technology, the, the distributed ledger technology. But on top of that, I think the second thing which is very likely to happen is asset tokenization. I do think, if you think about the history of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm calling money, but you think of most stuff, uh, technology leads to a change in the form factor in the way you think about value and transfer value around. It's happened in the past from, you know, cowrie shells to physical gold coins to paper money and so on uh, to credit cards and plastic. So it's not unreasonable to assume that as technology evolves, the form factor of value could change. Uh, REITs are a great case. You took a building and then you sort of uh, unitized it and you distributed it in REIT form. When you think and um, put those ideas together, form factor value can change and you can already know how to securitize and unitize assets. I do think tokenization will play a big role and tokenized assets could become uh, quite compelling. I just think about the future. I, I do think uh, when you take uh, ideas like money, um, and that's the third level, I think they'll, you know, private money is not easy. And I don't think you'll see a lot of private money. And you will see the Bitcoins of the world, but I don't think they'll fulfill the, the, the old-fashioned role of money as a medium of exchange and store as a unit of account. But I do think that uh, even as a store of value, you will start seeing some things like Bitcoin. Uh, I do think public money, which is fiat money, is backed by central banks. That could take this new form. Central bank digital currencies, uh, cross-border you know, digital money. I think those could definitely happen uh, in the next years to come. So I think blockchain has got some real possibilities of driving change, both at the base level, at the tokenization level, and then eventually in some forms of, of, of money too. And finally, your last comment of uh, you know metaverse and uh, stuff like that. I, you know, if you think about the success of gaming today, the 3.2 billion people who play games, virtual games, uh, versus 2 odd billion people who play physical sports. So it's already a big population out there. And if you look at the quality of some of these games today, I mean, you have virtual reality already. If you think about Squid Game, the really popular Netflix movie last year, my own uh, insight on that is the large part of the success of that movie was it effectively brought this virtual world to life for a lot of people. So I do think you start finding more and more use cases where people want to be in a you know decentralized land or sandbox kind of world, um, and you will see a lot more use cases around that too. And therefore, if you ask me where are we going and you know what is the bank of the future and DBS of the future, I can't necessarily tell you. Will it be different from where we are? I think there's a high likelihood. And the way we are playing the game, therefore, is to make sure we have enough uh, irons in the fire, enough focus in the fire. So we understand what's going on. We build the skill sets. We are leading some of these things uh, and hoping that you know, if one of them takes off, that will be great. Even if they don't, it will allow us uh, learning and allow us a seat at the table.
Absolutely. It's uh, of course you're talking about changing the that uh, the future is changing for banking and finance, and uh, you touched on perhaps even the architecture of that uh, uh, banking and finance uh, future. And I wonder in your your thoughts around replacing like big infrastructure like uh, Swift and the underlying messaging architecture being replaced entirely by blockchain. Is that uh, likely to be a reality in the uh, near uh, future? Then I'm, I'm not talking about the organization SWIFT, but if you think mm. about the architecture of all networks today, and whether um, it's SWIFT or any of the other uh, you know messaging architectures, they still support a hub and spoke arrangement. If you think about the way SWIFT works, if I want to transfer money to you in Hong Kong, right, I send two messages out. I send one message to the Hong Kong your, your bank saying, hey, I'm transferring money to Daniel. But simultaneously, I send a second message out and that message will go to my bank in New York, which will then send that message to your bank, your banker's bank in New York, which will then send the message to your bank saying the money has been transferred. So it's a parallel mode. The messaging communication goes independently of the value transfer. And there's been one of the big bugbears of international clearing and settlements. The actual messaging is instant, but the settlement takes T plus two, two days to happen. Now, what the blockchain does, it turns it all on its head because I can actually create and transfer value to you at the same time as I send the communication message. And if you reflect on that, then you have to say that a new infrastructure, a new network, which capitalizes on this ability to transfer value with the message, that has to arise. Now, whether Swift you know, changes itself to do that or whether alternative networks arise is anybody's guess. Uh, one of the things that you know we are trying to lead, along with a couple of other players, J JP Morgan, uh, Timasek, we have a few more banks already, is to see if we can actually start creating a similar network. We have a company called Partior, which is focused on that. You know, how do you use blockchains to do cross-border settlement in real time? Uh, we have a lot of interest from a lot of different uh, partners in different currencies, uh, but we are not the only ones. Other people are trying to do that as well. Uh, if you ask me five, ten years from now, will you see an alternative settlement regime? I think the answer is probably yes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting comments. Uh, thank you, Piyush. It also likely will affect the shape of competition uh, in in this industry, the financial services industry. Now, uh, with all the headwinds, the tailwinds you see swirling ahead, uh, do you see like fintech? Uh, Still, uh, many a decade ago, we talk about fintech eating the lunch of the banks. Do you see that happening still, or do you see that has also itself uh, transformed? That, you know, first of all, if you reflect back over the last six, seven years, I've always maintained that um, this idea of fintech will eat the lunch of the banks is, um, you know, overpaid. Uh, in fact, I've often said Bill Gates in the 90s said. People need banking, they don't need banks. And, you know, 25, 30 years later, lo and behold, you know, the banks are still around. Um, I think what is quite clear is the nature of banking will change. Um, and when the nature of banking change, the fundamentals of banking are still the same. People have money, they need to save money, they need to invest money, money needs to be moved around, you need to borrow money, you need to put money to work. Those fundamentals don't change. How you go about doing this does change. Now, who the players are, is it's an open game. And uh, it's equally open to the banks as it is to large technology companies. And therefore, my view has been that if you think of yourself as a technology company and you focus on customer journeys and cannibalize your own way, the way you work, you can be a meaningful player in the future of banking. So if you look at the world today, you know, most of the banks are transforming themselves to be able to offer the same technology and the same technology solutions as the Googles and Amazons and Alios of the world are. I think the future belongs to the people who have the capacity to be nimble, the capacity to adapt, and the capacity to embrace new technology in fulfilling customer need. And whether you are called Amazon or whether you're called DBS doesn't really matter very much. So that's uh, part A. Uh, but part B to more specifically your question, I do think that the competitive environment in the universe has also changed in the last couple of years. Um, and I think uh, two things have uh, proven to, uh, to, to post some more headwinds on traditional technology players than had been anticipated in the past. Uh, the first of these is, uh, you know, regulatory leveling up. Uh, in many countries, some of these companies benefited from regulatory arbitrage. And what has happened in the last two, three years is that several regulators, the Chinese, of course, uh, stand out, have actually started addressing that, uh, trying to make sure 
that these technology players have the same expectations or you have the same expectations of them in terms of capital requirements, liquidity requirements, KYC, AML requirements, etc., etc. And so uh, in most of the countries in which we operate, we're beginning to see that, that there's a leveling of the regulatory playing field. The second thing that's happened, and this is more recent in the last year, uh, is that uh, there's from the investor universe, there's beginning to be a rethink about the willingness to let companies burn money endlessly without any pathway to profitability. Uh, a colleague of mine calls it the shift from cash burn to cash earn. Uh, people, investors are beginning to say, you know, where is the EBITDA? At least where is the line of sight for EBITDA? And once that starts happening, you can see that many of the biggest tech companies are beginning to see dramatic drop in values and valuation, which means they don't have this unending pool of money which they can just take and burn. Uh, that's been a challenge for the incumbent industry. You have to fight with one hand behind your back because you were trying to make a quarterly uh, earning, whereas your competition was quite happy to lose money for 10 years. But that's also being redressed. And therefore, I think that as you go forward for the next uh, couple of years at least, uh, you're going to see a more balanced and more level playing field in terms of the competitive landscape than we have seen in the last several years. Do you structurally, uh, because of all of these changes, uh, do you see uh, DBS as a bank or banks in general uh, changing the way it's making money and also the way you fund yourself going forward as a result of all these, perhaps both headwinds and tailwinds as well? Well, I, mean, I think, you know, the core of banking, I said, the fundamentals don't change. And I would suspect for the foreseeable future, the next decade, um, the bulk of our uh, income streams and our value creation will come from the core business. Um, so our capacity to raise money, put money to work, you know, do a whole bunch of alternative products around that, transaction services, etc. That will continue to be the mainstay of what we do. Uh, just reflecting back on my previous conversations, to win in that game, we have to continue to adapt. So it's not business as usual. We will have to embrace more technology. We'll have to embrace AI. We'll have to create new customer value propositions. But the root uh, genesis of, uh, you know, how do you make money? The, the capacity to create a margin, the capacity to create fee-based income, uh, I think that won't fundamentally change. However, what we're doing at the same time is trying to dial up a couple of alternative sources of income and revenue. Uh, secondarily, relates to uh, catering for all of these changes in uh, financial infrastructure, the, the new digital architecture we spoke about. And therefore, in the last couple of years, in addition to the three MA trades you talked about, we've also announced and launched a half a dozen new businesses. We announced a crypto exchange, which allows you to tokenize assets, to trade currencies and other token assets, to customize assets. We announced Partier, I spoke about that, uh, infrastructure to do blockchain-based cross-border settlements. Uh, we announced uh, another company which is also focused on digitizing the fixed income space from issuer to uh, 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 end investor. Uh, we're looking at uh, the possibility of uh, you know uh, democratized wealth using digital wealth tools and seeing if we can actually white label it through other third parties. We're trying to do the same thing for our payments platform, DPS Limit. So a bunch of different things we're doing. And I suspect in the next few years, the scale of these will be small. Uh, but uh, eventually, if any one or more of these take off or the world goes the way we think it might, this could have subsequent uh, uh, substantive value creation uh, for the bank. The third thing we're doing, which is uh, uh, quite interesting, and uh, we're not the only ones, other people have done it in the past. Uh, what's turned out is over the last seven, eight years, because of all the work we've done in technology, uh, we have built a lot of really good technology assets. You know, I used to say we're more a tech company which does financial services. Turns out the technology that we build is relevant to even companies who are not in financial services. How do you move from on-prem to public cloud in a secured way, as an example? How do you actually create a whole suite of products and capabilities that can support uh, you know, a, a customer onboarding? Uh, and we began to see a lot of interest from the industry, uh, financial services industry and outside, for the technology solutions and tools that we build. And so we're actually exploring, taking some of the solutions and packaging them and seeing if we can actually uh, monetize the technology that we've created in our industry and outside our industry as well. Now, again, I want to go back to the uh, uh, fundamental. I think a large part of our value creation will still be the core business of what we've done. But all of the incremental stuff that we're doing, I think it has some real possibilities 
of creating value, creating greater visibility to the assets that we have. And eventually, some of these might really scale to uh, wind up creating good cash flows as well. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, we still are in the banking sector, financial services. I know it's a tech driven banking services. What well, two things that stand out, I suspect, for you is driving uh, efficiency as well as uh, uh, driving down costs. Uh, when you do your cost benefit calculator calculation in dollars and cents uh, over the last uh, seven, eight years, how much is the payback directly attributable uh, from digital to DBS uh, being uh, where you are today? Well, it's quite material, Daniel. We showcased in 2017 uh, what we call digital value capture, uh, which uh, demonstrated that as customers increase their digital activity in the bank, two things happen. One, you get more of their wallet because it's just easier to deal with you. I call this the Amazon Prime effect. You know, Amazon Prime, as you get more comfortable with this, you start doing your marginal shopping over there. And that's true with banking as well. We start getting the marginal wallet increase for the customer. But the second thing that happens is your cost of servicing goes down. You have less use for the branches. You have less use for cash and currency. You have less paper transactions. You can reduce the size of your back office, etc. And uh, we showcased then with three years of data from 2014 to 2017 that you could actually see in that segment, which we showcased this for half of our business, the SME and retail, that you could see a, a half a percent improvement in your cost income ratio driven both by income and cost uh, every year. Now, it's been five years since then. And uh, at the end of five years, we can continue to show that, that you see a half percent improvement in cost income ratio every year as this transition and transformation takes place. So the return on equity we get from the digitized part of our business is substantially higher than the ROE of the other parts of our business. So that's for sure. Uh, but what we are also seeing uh, increasingly in the last few years is the quote unquote other part of the business itself is digitizing and we're beginning to see efficiency there as well. Uh, the large corporate business, for example, you take uh, cash management and uh, you know we talked about this a few weeks ago. The whole uh, architecture of cash management has changed because we're now doing a lot for embedded cash management. So instead of having people come to our bank and use our platforms and our ideal service or even a host to host connect, they are API platform is embedded into a thousand different platforms and companies across Asia and it's deeply embedded and it's embedded at uh, a specific customer journey in, you know, in, in the platform journey or the corporate journey. That reduces our customer acquisition cost and our volume origination cost. And you can see that flow through our transaction banking, our flow of businesses massively up, our balances are up, and our costs are well contained. We can see that in our TNM, our, our markets business. As we digitize the outreach to the platform, as we digitize the algo in our trading book, you can see that uh, our total volumes are going up, so the flow is going up, our positioning capabilities improve, but our costs are uh, really well contained. So the general thesis that digitization helps both revenue accretion but also cost efficiency, I think that continues to be borne out. Uh, listening to you, Piyush, I get super excited every time I hear all of these changes happening at DBS. And uh, for the past decade, in, the, in addition to digital, uh, you are a big advocate for this region in terms of uh, opportunities and growth. Uh, uh, Asia, Asia has been the growth engine uh, with the likes of China, India, and the ASEAN uh, region firing on all sin cylinders. Of course, COVID has now stalled uh, some of those drivers of growth. Uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, all this digital uh, transformation underway that we're seeing in this region, not just in banking, but also in businesses, um, we are also facing some very challenging times, such as a war in Europe, inflation, rate hikes, and the longer term impact of climate change uh, to all of us. Uh, we seem to be, in my opinion, heading into uncharted waters. How worried are you? Is Asia still the future like you believed a, a decade ago? And how best uh, to navigate into this uncertain future? Daniel, the short answer is you know, Asia is still the future without the shadow of a doubt. And you have to understand that when you think about the future, you have to think in long time frames, long swathes. Uh, my favorite um, uh, analogy is if this was 1900 and you had the opportunity to invest in the US, uh, knowing in advance 
that you are going to see a massive Fed crisis in 1913, uh, that you're going to see the First World War, you're going to see a Great Depression, you're going to see the Second World War, and you're going to see a whole bunch of different issues over the next 50 years. Would that put you off from investing in the U.S.? The answer has to be an unequivocal no, because with hindsight, the best thing you could have done was taken a 100-year view on the U.S. So to me, the parallel for Asia in 2000 is exactly that. If you have to take a 50-year view on Asia, you have to look at the fundamental mega trends, and those are very long-lasting. It's 50% of the world's population. Remember, for hundreds of years, till the 17th century, this was the focus of or the, or the centerpiece of world's GDP, China, India, you know, Southeast Asia. With 50% of the world's population, with a massive resource base, uh, with a young and growing population, with wealth accumulation, I think over a long period of time, uh, Asia is here to stay. It's not going uh, anywhere. Uh, on top of that, uh, I, as I said before, Asia from 1980s to call it 2010, the big story of the Asian tigers and the Asian dragons and then even China was Asia was the factory of the world. And it's true. Asia took 30 years as factory of the world to start really driving an export-oriented strategy. Uh, well, what's quite clear, certainly in the last 10, 15 years, is that Asia is not only a factory, but is now also the marketplace of the world. If you look at most of the growth in the last uh, post-GFC, 2009 to 2022, it's all been self-generated. The fastest growth in consumption has been Asia. The fastest growth in retail spend has been Asia. Uh, even though the U.S. has geopolitical tensions with China, when you look under the hood you, and you figure how many of the U.S. companies are pulling out of China or pulling out of the region, precious few. And the reason for that, it's the biggest market for the next 10, 20 years. How would you pull away from your biggest market? So I think the mega trends, the demographics, the technology shifts, the wealth creation, I think those favor a long-term uh, Asian century. Uh, I don't think, well, at least the next 20, 30 years, I think they're going to be here. But having said that, uh, the reason emerging markets are difficult uh, to handle is you go through ups and downs. You know, you go through cycles. And in cycles, you have to have the nimbleness and the adaptability to pace yourself. Sometimes you push your foot on the pedal. Sometimes you take it off. Um, if you do it cleverly, then you don't have to exit the market. You can be there for the long term. In most countries, the companies who have been able to take it and have the wherewithal and the capacity to be there for the long term have eventually benefited. Many companies don't do that. You sort of come in and you go out. And if you take a come in and go out strategy, you, you know, a lot of times you miss time. And it's very hard to sort of go back and rebuild positions. Uh, one of our own uh, strengths, I believe, at DBS, is because we are centered over here, uh, this is our backyard, we have, you know, the, the shareholders who have the willingness and capacity to take a 20-year view. I think it gives us the, the ability to, to do that, to take a 10, 15, 20-year long-term view. Uh, and in that kind of uh, time frame and construct, as long as we don't stub our toes very badly along the way, I think we'll do okay. Yush, uh, thanks uh, for sharing the vision of the future and giving us a lesson of the past, I like that, right? We got the, both the future and the past. Uh, my last question, is uh, DBS going to be in the metaverse next year? You know, Danny, we kicked, the, kicked it around. Should we, you know, buy some space on Decentraland or Sandbox? And I figured at this point in time, I couldn't really come up with a good use case for it, other than, you know, putting my, my portrait over there and saying we're cool. Uh, and so we are experimenting. We've rented some space on a couple of these uh, metaverse uh, situations. Uh, but we're also, apart from actually putting a property in the metaverse, we are crafting a lot of other metaverse uh, kind of solutions. One of the use cases for me is that uh, many of these things, the metaverse are using NFTs. And the journey to convert from fiat to crypto to NFT and back is a clunky journey. So that's something that we could look at saying, can you streamline the journey as an example? So you don't really have to have a face in the metaverse to play in the metaverse, uh, is my point. And we're looking at uh, options and alternatives. In fact, like I said, we have a few things we're working on right now. Uh, let's see what plays out. Wonderful, Piyush. Always a pleasure. Thank you for speaking to us at the Asset Talk. It's been a very stimulating conversation, as always. Uh, please continue to stay safe, Piyush. And I hope, right, to be able to, I hope to be able to come to you uh, in Singapore before too long. Okay, I look forward to it. All right, bye now, cheers. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Piyush.
We've been listening to Piyush Gupta, CEO of DBS, sharing his insights on the bank, the future of the industry, and also a quick history lesson on why Asia is still the future, despite plenty of headwinds that may discourage the faint-hearted. Uh, thank you for joining us on another edition of the Asset Talk. Please keep in touch till our next broadcast. Continue to stay safe and take care of each other. Thank you.